Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs in Sydney. Our topic tonight could hardly be more timely. Sad, but timely. We've all heard a lot about Ukraine in recent days, indeed in, in recent weeks, but our speaker tonight is taking a step back and addressing Ukraine's as a case study in the plight of smaller powers caught between competing great powers. Our speaker is Dr. Alex Korolev, who is a senior lecturer in politics and international relations at the University of New South Wales. He holds graduate degrees from the Nankai University in China and the Zhuanlai School of Government and a PhD from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Dr. Korolev will speak for around half an hour, following which we'll have half an hour for questions and discussion. Please address your questions at any time during his address or during the question and answer session using the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. But that's enough for housekeeping. It's over to Dr. Korolev. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you for, for inviting me. And um, it's been a busy time for me. And there is a, the, the joke within the family is that if I'm getting busy, then the world is on the brink of collapse, basically. So that's, that's what's happening here, I think. Um, smaller states, I mean, it's great power rivalry, the case of Ukraine. Can you speak more into the microphone? Some people can't hear. Okay. So... Uh, a smaller states amidst great power rivalry, the case of Ukraine. And uh, uh, indeed, I'm going to look at the case of Ukraine as a, as a case uh, which, is, which, is, uh, um, which is unique, but also not unique in the sense that it's in terms of uh, being a case of, uh, of how smaller, smaller powers behave and uh, the options available to smaller powers when, when, when they when they're affected by great power rivalry. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a brief brief outline of my presentation. So, um, well, I'm a, I'm, an, I'm a theorist, so I will, um, I will make you suffer a little bit through some theoretical stuff because it's very important. And um, um, I will talk about how I approach this problem, how I'm trying to understand it, but my analytical lens, and this is where um, the problem I see here is the prevalence of reductionist approaches, uh, what I also call the wrong level of analysis. There is a lot of discussion of the individual level, the role of individuals, the role of political leaders in this, um, in this crisis, as well as many other crises. Like, uh, I'm going to, um, in a sense, cast my net much wider to, to also talk about systemic approach and uh, the importance of structural factors in um, in interpreting and understanding the the um, um, the crisis, be it Ukraine crisis or any other crisis, and finally, uh, uh, I will present the case which I call between Sil and Charybdis, uh, the lead up to the Ukraine crisis. Uh, next slide, please. So, and before that, just uh, this is a bit of historical excursus, and this is what I call the tragedy of small power politics. Um, this is an interesting case, and I find it very interesting because it, it can be so easily extrapolated on the contemporary geopolitics, especially surrounding smaller states and Ukraine specifically. Uh, this is so-called Milian dialogue from the history of Peloponnesian War, uh, famous major work in the, in, the, in the theory and history of international relations. Um, basically, what happened there is a, a small state of malice uh, was just between two competing, fighting uh, larger powers, Athens and Sparta, and there was a very famous, uh, what is now called Milian dialogue. Basically, it's a dialogue be between the state of malice and Athens before uh, the malice was annihilated and defeated, basically, and the dialogue was. Um, so Melians basically asked the Athenians, why, why can't we just be sort of left alone? You know, why can't we just be um, 
non-aligned, you know, being neutral in a sense. Um, and the Athenians replied that, look, uh, your hostility cannot really harm us. What, what really can harm us is, is your friendship um, because it will be an indication of, 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 of our weakness. And then uh, Melian said, look, but we are, you know, we're not afraid of you because we are fighting for, we are fighting against like unjust behavior and we are just men fighting against unjust. And uh, also, yes, we're weaker, but we have allies. And our, well, they, they were referring to their alliance with the Lacedaemonians, and they believed that Lacedaemonians would help them and would defend them uh, and would sort of fence off the threat coming from the Athens. And the uh, Athenians replied, look, we think that we are fighting for a just cause too, you know? Well, justice is a very tricky category here. And uh, basically, Lacedaemonians are not going to help you. Uh, because what they said, what an intending ally trusts to is not the goodwill of those who ask his aid, but a decided superiority of power for action. So, and then the, the famous ending of this dialogue is that basically the strong do what they can and the weak suffers what they must. Um, next slide, please. This is, a, and, and then there was a defeat of, of, of Melos. Uh, Interesting to extrapolate their own contemporary. Um, and, and the most important thing about it, that Lacedaemonians actually didn't help. The allies didn't help. Um, the case of Russia-Georgian war of August of 2008, um, just as a, as a context, uh, there were multiple indications of alignment between Georgia and the United States. Uh, more than 2,000 Georgian soldiers were stationed in Iraq. It was the third largest uh, contingent in the coalition. Uh, there were multiple strategic agreements with NATO, including the um, transit agreement, uh, significant political, economic, and military support, um, and Bucharest summit of 2007, basically, when 2008, my apologies, when uh, US announced that Georgia will join NATO sooner or later, which of course uh, disturbed Russians a lot, and um, this basically is the reason of the major cause of the Russia-Georgia war. And Condoleezza Riceberg then said, we will do everything that we can to help resolve these conflicts. She was referring to this breakaway republics. Georgia also had two breakaway republics, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Um, then there was military operation. Georgian army was defeated. Independence of the two breakaway republics recognized. Uh, then the outcome was, uh, next slide, please. Very interesting. So that was the outcome, okay? Uh, two great powers, and I understand why Lavrov is smiling, but I don't understand why his counterpart is smiling so happily. Uh, so after the Ukraine, after the, the, the Russia-Georgia war of 2008, what happened actually is that US offered Russia a reset Okay, it failed eventually because it didn't address uh, structural um, problems in this in Russia-US relations, especially Russia-NATO relations. But that was the outcome of the war, and uh, the membership of Georgia and NATO is a long way off. That's the outcome, basically. Uh, next slide, please. So here we're looking at the Ukraine crisis, um, and basically, yes, there are sanctions. That, yes. Uh, NATO, uh, US are sending weapons to, to Ukraine, which I think is extremely counterproductive because it will never tip the balance in favor of Ukraine, but it will make things much more complicated. Uh, because no matter how much they send, Russia will, will, have, will have 10 times more. Um, so Volodymyr Zelensky said, who is ready to fight alongside us? I don't see anyone who is ready to give Ukraine a guarantee of NATO membership. Everyone is afraid. So he called like 27 members of EU and NATO, asking them, can you just confirm, you know, the membership or secure any security guarantees? Not a single one confirmed anything. Because here we're dealing with great power confrontation. And uh, nobody's going to fight for, for, for Ukraine. Nobody, I mean, in, within the NATO, fight with Russia for, for Ukraine. And this is this is crystal clear and was understood 
from the very beginning. So it's very tragic what, what, what happened because if this understanding is fully recognized that probably we wouldn't be here today. Um, and next slide, please. So then I'm trying to explain all that, right? Uh, and there are different ways to explain a crisis like a Ukraine crisis or Georgia, Russia, Georgia war. Um, and the problem I think, and, and this is what I call reductionist theories and the wrong level of analysis problem. So what is the level of analysis? Level of analysis is basically uh, the unit of, now how do you answer a question, for example, why, why wars happen? And it was first systematized by Kenneth Waltz in his famous book, Man, the State and War, three levels, right? Individuals, states, international systems. So if it's individuals, it means the war is the outcome of uh, policy makers, you know, like the outcome of their decision making, basically. States is like the war is the outcome of uh, the institutional characteristics of states, well, whether it's democracy or dictatorship, for example, right? And Walt, Waltz wasn't the only one who addressed the problem of the levels of, of the levels of analysis. There were multiple variations, like um, the three levels is the most kind of classical kind of scheme to approach, but there were many others, like some introduced four levels, like squeezing bureaucracy between individual level and nation state level. The problem is that in the, I think in the current understanding, we see the prevalence of um, individual level of analysis. So it's all about Putin or, or Xi Jinping or, or Donald Trump or, or Biden. And it's all, it's, sometimes it's, it's uh, some uh, um, like assessments are really based on, oh, you know, did you see his eyes or did you see his, his hands were shaking? You know, what does that mean? Does he look like Stalin looked like in 1939? You know, this kind of stuff. Does it mean that this is, it, it's interesting, it's entertaining, but it's, uh, it's counterproductive sometimes. Because why? Because in, in the international relations theories, these levels, individual level and state level, are considered reductionist approaches, okay? What are reductionist approaches? Uh, those that concentrate causes at the individual or national level and assume the whole can be understood by understanding all of its parts. And this only international systemic level uh, is, is um, kind of what constitutes the systemic approach, which conceives of causes operating at the international level and believe that internal explanations alone cannot explain how states choose to act. External conditions matter. Political led leaders, they, they, they don't act in vacuum. They, 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 they operate within certain incentive structures created by, by, by the system configuration, structural configuration of international system. And this is the level which has been neglected a lot because we, we hear a lot about, you know, the leadership styles, wrong foreign policy decisions, miscalculations and so on and so forth. But we often neglect the, the structure level. This is what I'm going to focus. Um, without going into details a lot, um, just, um, um, just to highlight that if we look at the structural level, then what we see recently is the change of international structure. The year of 2000, China's GDP was 10% of American GDP. Now, now it's 70% of, of American GDP. Uh, this is more important, this is, this is a structural shift. And Russia's, Russia's, uh, uh, Russia has shown an 11-fold increase in GNP, even though Russia is often pictured as a declining power, uh, military spending increased dramatically. So what happened is the current structure is going through the, the stage of power transition, okay? We have the established uh, unipolar power, if you like, and we have challenging states that are catching up um, in terms of comprehensive capabilities. So what happens at this stage of systemic transformation is that because when the gap in power is too, too large, then there is no point of challenging uh, the, the most powerful state because it's just too powerful. It's only when uh, it's still more powerful, but 
the the sort of the gap power gap is shrinking this is when uh the, the we are entering a very dangerous stage of global politics and this quote is very important it's from the recent um, national defense strategy commission of the us in a special special congressional report um, experts concluded that us's military military superiority has eroded to a dangerous degree to the extent that the us might struggle to win or perhaps lose a war against china or russia especially if it's forced to fight on two or more fronts simultaneously this is extremely important from the standpoint of uh, power transition uh, and for our understanding of uh, the crisis uh, in, in Ukraine and elsewhere. So what's happening is the intensifying great power rivalry. Uh, it really challenges the, the status quo and makes a life for smaller states uh, extremely difficult. Um, so what we see is the rise of systemic pressure. What is the rise of systemic pressure? Basically, so when structural change happens, uh, it sort of it gets trickled down into regional geopolitical environments in the form of regional security complexes. Okay, uh, basically, systemic pressure is a function of the relationship between the actual or potential rivals of a great power from other part of the world and small state in its immediate vicinity. To put it simply, is basically when the extra, extra regional great power enhances military cooperation with a smaller power in the immediate vicinity of another great power, this is the when, when, when systemic pressure intensifies. And this is when uh, basically a great power confrontation trickles down into, into different geopolitical environments. And it was captured very well by uh, regional security complex theory, basically which argues that closing of the power gap between the US and the rest results in the rise of challenger states and emergence and precipitation of geopolitically charged regional security complexes. Uh, next, next slide, please. So currently there are two of them, two regional security complexes that will determine the evolution of global politics in the next decade or, or even longer. One is extremely contentious regional security complex in, in, Eastern, in Eastern Europe. So this is an outcome of uh, eastward expansion of NATO and Russia accumulation of military capabilities by Russia. So this one is very contentious. It's already sort of exploding. It started to explode in 2008 uh, during Russia-Georgia war, and it, uh, it continued after that, sort of there, there, it's on and off in a sense, but now it's a full, full blown explosion of the Eastern European regional security complex. The second regional security complex is still in formation, is in the process of formation. It's a Asia Pacific regional security complex. So you can call it in the Pacific regional security complex where China and the United States are increasingly competing with each other. And uh, this is a, a system forming kind of structural trend because uh, US and China are on collision course as well. And they, it's not going to change anytime soon simply because it's, a, it's an outcome of structural transformation. So we see in Asia Pacific as well, uh, this overlap collision zone between uh, One Belt, One Road Initiative and the US led in the Pacific strategy and smaller states there such as the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, are struggling really uh, trying to navigate between this intensifying great power rivalry. So I call this one as the Eastern European security complex is extremely charged. And that one is precipitating sort of it in the process of becoming um, intensive. It's a, it's a, as, as US China relations deteriorate that regional security complex will become more obviously contentious. Uh, next slide please. So this is a sort of, I, I borrow this uh, uh, expression from Wolfer's book on, on international relations series called House on Fire, uh, the intensification of systemic pressure. So basically what's happening is smaller states are starting to fall into cracks uh, of great power competition, mostly between Russia and the West and China and the West. And this is a long-term trend it's not going to 
finish anytime soon. And now it's probably in the case of Eastern European regional security complex, uh, it has entered a very intense stage of, of rivalry because Russia is not going to let uh, Ukraine or Georgia join NATO. This is simply not going to happen. Uh, and uh, it looks like uh, the West, well, by the West, mostly I mean the United States because they, uh, uh, they run the show in a sense. They are not interested in brokering neutrality for Ukraine. So uh, obviously the uh, Russia and the West are more interested in prevailing in this conflict rather than preventing it. So this is, this is otherwise Ukraine would, would, would be neutral uh, years ago. So instead we see this, you know, uh, uh, sending arms to, to, to Ukraine and Russia also, Russia's aggressive behavior. Um, so this is, a, this is an outcome of structure. Of course, political leaders matter, okay? Of course, uh, but what the real effect is the, is the shape, is the actual materialization of this structural competition. Not, they're not the cause of that. Uh, next slide, please. And um, this is very interesting. This is the evidence of the zero sum game by Russia and the West towards Ukraine. Uh, in the year, as early as the year of 2011, back then Viktor Yanukovych said, I intend to establish stable, strong partnerships with the European Union, Russia, and the US. Ukraine continues to work towards integration to the European Union, and Russia is not preventing us from implementing the reforms we're undertaking in terms of this goal. No, that's not, that's not how the world works, unfortunately, for, for, for smaller powers. Uh, this, I'm not going to read all that, but you can see this is uh, uh, basically the, 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 the rhetoric that in the lead up to the Ukraine crisis between, between Russian officials and uh, Europeans and uh, European and American officials. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Uh, Medvedev in 2008 said, we've demarcated traditional sphere of interest of Russia. Of Russia. Then Joe Biden, 2009, we will not recognize any nation having sphere of influence. Then Sergei Lavrov, 2010. What is the Eastern partnership? Is it a sphere of influence, including Belarus? Then European experts said, the answer of course is yes. In the post-Soviet space, neutrality is not an option for Europe. We are engaged in a systemic competition with Russia. Then Glaziev, Glaziev was the uh, uh, head of uh, um, custom union committee basically, said we cannot, you, you, Ukraine has to join, Ukraine doesn't have, and the only option for Ukraine is full participation in the custom union, to which European officials responded by saying, it's impossible for Ukraine to align with both the EU and custom, Ukraine should choose which path to take. Even partial accession to custom union would be problematic. Then Hillary Clinton uh, in, in 2012 already, very close to the outbreak of the first Ukraine crisis said, put it very straight actually, that the, the Eurasian Economic Union uh, is not going to be called Soviet Union perhaps. It's not going to be called, it's going to be called Custom Union. It will be called the Eurasian Union and all of that. But let's make no mistake. We know what the goal is and we are trying to figure out effective ways to slow down or prevent it. So this is when US-China kind of, US, sorry, US-Russia rivalry really became extremely obvious and uh, it never changed. Even, even during the, the first iteration of Ukraine crisis uh, after the year of 2014, uh, neither Russia nor the West were interested in brokering kind of uh, way out for Ukraine in a sense, some sort of arrangement for Ukraine. Uh, quite the opposite, basically it's, Ukraine, the, the room for Ukraine to maneuver has been shrinking and shrinking. Uh, and uh, the, the outcome was very, very tragic. But is it, is it really kind of uh, unusual outcome? Well, there are multiple cases of, of smaller states being squeezed between, between great powers and sort of, and as great power competition intensifies, the, for them, the, the, the room for hedging shrinks dramatically. It, this is a very dangerous moment in, in, uh, for them. Either you need to uh, 
announce neutrality or or you need to really be be able to um, to hedge, which is very difficult. Next slide, please. Well, implications. It's interesting. Well, the case of Australia is very diff different. But if you if you go back to 2010, 2011, 2012, uh, well, obviously, Australian policymakers were announcing that Australia can maintain close strategic alliance with the US while also enhancing its friendship with China, despite Beijing's growing military and economic clout in Asia Pacific. For Australia, this is not an either or question. We can have strong, long standing friendship with the US alliance and alliance with the, with the US, but also positive engagement with China. We don't have to choose between China and the US. Well, obviously, uh, the, after the signing of AUKUS alliance, the, 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 uh, uh, Australia has made a choice. And uh, um, it's, it's sort of geopolitically remote from what's going on uh, in, in, in Eastern Europe. But this is an indication of how actually uh, um, great power competition reduces the, the room available for smaller states to hedge its economic and security bets. And uh, last slide. So conclusion is that uh, basically hedging, well, what is hedging? Hedging basically is a, is a strategy which allows smaller states avoiding putting all eggs in one basket, sort of, you know, uh, multi-vector cooperation, if you like. Hedging is a luxury. Room for hedging as a foreign policy option for states is inversely related to the intensity of the pressure coming from the international system. Um, small powers should avoid by all means elevating regional issues to the level of system level, great power competition. And I can give you uh, many examples here. Basically, the moment, even if we look at the South China Sea, the moment when uh, interaction of China with a smaller state shifts from the bilateral level, let's say disagreement over, 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 over maritime uh, uh, territory or, or those islands and islets. The moment it moves to the level of US-China rivalry, this is when things are getting very difficult for, for smaller states because uh, stakes increase dramatically. And it's no longer by a bilateral issue between China and the smaller state. It's about China and the United States. And small state will, is, will be inevitably in a disadvantaged position. So the question here is, do smaller states have a choice except official neutrality when great power competitions intensive, competition intensifies? Well, that's a, uh, I'm not very optimistic about this one because uh, unfortunately, uh, and this is what, what I call, and in, in the literature, it's also called uh, the tragedy of small power politics, basically there is no way out for them. If great powers, great power competition intensifies, uh, policymakers and smaller powers, they have to be extremely skillful and extremely capable of uh, playing these geopolitical games. And the reality is that not all of them can do that. So I think I'll stop here. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. Our first question is from John Hallam, and I'll paraphrase, um, but it's requesting comments specifically um, around the examples that you gave in the Million Dialogue. So discussing Finland in 1939, Vietnam, and the fact that at the end of um, the, the discussion in the Million Dialogue, Athens lost the Peloponnesian War, and Sparta too was conquered, and how that is relevant to the example you brought in. Well, look, they, uh, of course, the the great powers can lose in the in the in those conflicts, and uh, we we don't know the outcome when it comes to great power confrontation. But uh, the damage to by the time they lose, the damage to smaller powers uh, has already been made, basically, and. Uh, this is this is the major problem here. So they can lose, they can they can win, uh, and uh, for great powers, these are not existential 
threats, honestly, losing or winning. Uh, but the, the problem is, and my focus is on smaller powers, the problem is that they, the smaller powers are those that get damaged severely when, when the great power competition intensifies. And they, they, they get damaged even before the actual conflict between, between great powers happen. Um, Finland was, was uh, I think that's, that's an example of a very, very smart, um, but uh, foreign policy by, by a smaller power. Uh, obviously, Ukraine is not trying to follow that path. Um, there are talks about Finlandization of Ukraine, but uh, so far it, it, um, it, it wasn't a successful, um, successful strategy. But answering your question, well, what happens to great powers, whether they win or lose, is, uh, is, is a separate, separate problem. The problem is that during this process, small power, the kind of damage they, they have to endure and they have to threats, the kind of threats they have to deal with are, are existential threats, very significant threats. Thank you. The next question is from Richard Panofsky. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Alexander. Can you, is this on? I think it is. Excellent. That, that's very nice to hear. Very good to hear, to hear what you have to say theoretically. My question, though, relates to what is going to happen in practice, given the infantile way in which the Western press, particularly in Australia, is characterising Putin and other leaders. It's, uh, we, we get no facts, we get opinion, and the opinion is often very bad. So we really don't know what is going on, nor do we know to the extent to which the Russian army is is invading and is going to take over uh, Ukraine at this stage. Seems to me three possible alternatives. One is Ukraine becomes like Belarus, uh, a, a state within or attached to or close to Russia. The Russians would be very pleased about that. It would, it would allay their existential fear of what Ukraine could become, given that it has been a route for invasions through many centuries into Russia. Second, it becomes neutral like Finland, as you said, or Sweden, or Austria, or Cyprus. All members of EU, but not members of NATO. It seems to me that if that had been something the Americans had been fair dinkum about and said, yeah, we really want a solution here, they would have taken up Putin's offer to, to work through that into some kind of neutrality that hasn't happened. And the third thing is, of course, it follows, uh, Ukraine follows uh, Zelensky's approach and says, no, we're going to join NATO, which is something that the Russians could not tolerate. So can I ask you, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? And may I say before you answer, it's delightful to be back here, Ian. Uh, it's okay. nice to see the new interns and see Jocelyn here. And I mean, we, we, we're hardly the hundred people we used to have, but we're getting back there. And it's very good to see. And you've done a wonderful job in keeping this place going with all the Zoom meetings you've had. Thank you. Thank you. This is a, this is a great question. And uh, I think the third scenario, out of the three, the third scenario is the least likely because it's simply not going to happen because uh, Russia will not let Ukraine join NATO. So there will be, it's, it's just not happening. And uh, there might be a lar large scale war with, with, between Russia and Europe, but it's not happening. But the, fir the, the first two, I think the first one, so-called Finlandization or some sort of neutrality for Ukraine with security guarantees, uh, I think this is the win, would be win-win situation. I don't know why, why um, neither the West or, and also no Russia, but mostly the United States, why they never, they didn't push for it. Well, the, since 2008, the push was is to pull Ukraine into NATO. And uh, this, is, this, is, this is very, uh, very puzzling. It's, uh, I think this is the, 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 the outcome of exactly what I was talking about, because it's not about Ukraine. It's about uh, uh, sort of winning geopolitical points against each other. Uh, between Russia and the, and, the, and the United States, by Russia and the United States. So now it's, um, I, I'm afraid that the, 
the situation has passed the point of no return and we might be heading towards the 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 second scenario which is like a, a de facto annexation of 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 ukraine uh which was will be very um it will be very difficult to sustain or we or we might be dealing with some long very protracted kind of conflict um and until us and russia sort of really um until the us is willing to to broker some sort of peaceful solution for ukraine this is very this is not going to i'm afraid improve the situation so i'm quite pessimistic unfortunately because i see it as a as a conflict that is uh, now maybe it started living life of its own but it was triggered by uh larger powers and their unwillingness to consider the interest of small power in this case ukraine basically Online question. Yep, question from online. This question is from Chris Skinner, uh, and it is, I guess, leading on from your pessimism. Do sanctions and other measures uh, without bloody warfare actually influence great powers in their dealings with smaller states? Uh, I don't see that happening. Um, I mean, I think, given the circumstances, there are no such sanctions that would have. Um, significant impact or would change uh, a great power, for, great powers foreign policy because, um, well, look, look at the North Korea, for example, a much smaller state has been under severe sanctions, like very tight sanctions, but still those sanctions, those sanctions failed to stop North Korean nuclear program. And here we're talking about large powers well, in this case, it's Russia, uh, which has support, de facto support of China. China is trying to be neutral, uh, but in the, the, given the gravity of the current situation, neutrality is, is support, basically. Uh, India was quite, the, the reaction was quite interesting because India uh, abstained from, from, from the vote uh, within uh, the United Nations and actually uh, India continues business as usual. Um, it's too dependent on Russian uh, military hardware. So I don't see that um, it, it's going to really shift uh, uh, Russia's foreign policy or foreign policy of any other great power. Um, this, and uh, another problem with sanctions, sanctions hit just regular people a lot, you know, this, uh, they announced saying Japan announced sanctions. They want to freeze Putin's uh, accounts or something, putting financial uh, uh, kind of um, like something with, with Putin doesn't have any. And, and even if he does, I mean, oh, come on, this kind of Japan sanctioning Putin, this is this is not not going to work simply. This is not or would like the, the West is sanctioning some oligarchs, you know. Uh, but at the same time, the European Union announced that, yes, we will cut you off the SWIFT system. However, it shouldn't apply to our energy trade, you know? What does that, what does that mean? It means that regular people will be affected by the sanctions, and those who benefit from, uh, from uh, export of mineral resources, they are not going to be affected, basically. The fact that they... They cannot go to the US or they don't care, honestly. This, the, the, this, this is not a um, significant kind of, um, doesn't have a significant impact on them. So um, sanctions are not, so far they failed to, to have any impact on uh, the foreign policy, but they did harm regular people a lot. Uh, and they failed to harm decision, top decision makers, but um, yeah. So no, I don't think it's it's effective. Thank you very much. I want to ask you a question about um, the uh, looking at it from the from the small powers rather than the the major powers, uh, because there is a point at which like the you know the ants where the elephant is dancing and the ant can get out of the way 
or it can uh, stay where it is. And uh, so looking at it, maybe not, not about Europe, which I know so not so much about, but in the case of um, US-China rivalry, Australia is maybe the ant that decided to stay where it was and is now getting squashed. Whereas uh, other ants, maybe New Zealand, Indonesia, some of our other neighbors, um, made a decision to, to get out of the way. That's how I, I'm putting it in a very simplistic way. Uh, but uh, what is it that drives the small power to choose one path rather than the other? Well, I think there are the major, the main, the main driver is also how larger powers see those smaller powers in, in, the, in the configuration of their geopolitical interests. Some states are smaller powers are allowed to get out of the way. And Australian, in, in the Australian case, well, Australia is a treaty ally of the United States. Yes, uh, it will, uh, will suffer from, to some extent, from uh, um, economic sanctions from China, or um, I think things have been already moving in that direction. Not exactly sanctions, but uh, trade restrictions. Um, but because it's a treaty ally with the United States, and uh, one of the most important ones, um, its security is covered in a sense by, by, the, by the alliance with the US. Um, other states, look, there are multiple factors that affect uh, their decision. Domestic politics sometimes has a very strong impact in Southeast Asia specifically, um, in the Philippines, for example, whether the, uh, the, the government that, that is in power, whether it's more pro-China or more pro-US. Pro uh, we had a very interesting episode with Duterte, who uh, the first thing he did is to announce, after becoming uh, president, to announce that he's turning away from uh, US and towards China and Russia. So this is, again, an indication of the shrinking room for, for, for hedging. Um, well, domestic politics matters in, in, in smaller powers uh, in the decision making. Um, and also, they, they're strategic position within this great power competition is very also very important and it matters a lot so it's more difficult for for small smaller powers that are uh, that are important for for great power strategic interests for them it's it's very difficult sort of to get out of the way um, for more for, for the less relevant ones it's more it's more feasible uh, but yeah, I mean, there are multiple factors, domestic politics, external pressure, the way they, uh, they, they position within the uh, configuration of geopolitical interests of great powers. So this is uh, one of the many uh, variables that, uh, that affect the decision making, I would say. Question online. So this question is from Crystal Law. And the question is, uh, why is Ukraine so valuable to the US um, and Russia? And in the end, do you think Ukraine would be better off choosing either the US or Russia? Well, why it's so valuable? Again, I think it's valuable. There are multiple, in the Russian case, well, historical uh, connection, cultural connection. Uh, but it's valuable because it happened to sit on the collision zone between two geopolitical projects. So it's sort of, uh, this is the major predicament of Ukraine that it's, it, it happened to be in the, uh, exactly in the, in, in the place where two incompatible geopolitical projects collide with each other. And here I'm talking about eastward expansion of NATO and, and, uh, and uh, Russia's, um, whatever you call it, Eurasian Economic Union, which is a geopolitical project more than an economic project or desire to restore uh, the, the, the greatness of Russia. So it's, a, it's in a very difficult uh, geopolitical position. And uh, it's, it's really at the intersection of, of the strategic competition between, between Russia and the West. So 
uh, and great power. It's also important. Great powers, they always uh, watch their back in the sense, their backyard. So Russia is not, Russia worries that the major uh, geopolitical fear in Russia too, that NATO will be too close to its borders, you know, and, and for, 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 the, for the West also, you know, having uh, sort of um, increasingly assertive and aggressive Russia um, is, is, is a geopolitical challenge. So it is a, um, the importance of Ukraine in a sense determined by, as, a, as I mentioned answering the previous question, by its uh, geopolitical location, geopolitical condition of Ukraine. Um, and answering the second part of your question, well, that's the problem that I think we are at the stage when Ukraine can decide very, very little, honestly. Uh, the, the taking aside would be, I think, a better, I think the best, the best um, strategy would be some sort of um, alignment with Russia, but again, uh, sort of trying at the early stages in the early 2000s when it was still possible uh, and cooperation with, with the West. And I think neutrality would also be a very, very good choice because I don't know why it's well that we have uh, neutral states that are prosperous Western democracies and they're fully part of uh, um, the, the bigger West, so to speak, and they, they're doing very well. Uh, like uh, Finland, Sweden were mentioned as they're not part of NATO. Um, at this point, it's um, unfortunately, I think the Ukraine can decide very little. And if, if it decides, if it makes decisions, those, are, those will be very costly uh, decisions. So um, Crimea is gone. It's not going to, uh, uh, Ukraine is not going to get it back. Uh, the situation with this breakaway republics that were recently recognized is, um, I think there is a way back because they, they were not really annexed. They were sort of recognized as independent actors, independent states. So I think in case that, um, uh, and they, this means they can decide as independent states that they, if they want to reunite with Ukraine, like the, there, is, there are no major obstacles, at least um, Russians can say always like, look, if, they, if Russia is interested in, 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 the, in this unification, say, well, let them decide, you know, and this can be brokered, I think. So uh, um, yeah, I think the room for decisions is, is really very, very, the Ukraine has very little leeway at the moment. And uh, um, it's a missed opportunity. So this kind of decisions should have been made uh, a long time ago. Thank you, Dr. Krovia, for your really interesting talk. Coming right back to the beginning, where you were talking about the Athenians and the Melians, really, that was a different scenario from what we're looking at now. The Thucydides trap was the thing, and that is between the Athenians and the Spartans. And what you have now is the equivalent, but with two with another player, so that you've got the established hegemon, the United States, you've got two aspiring rivals, Russia and China. And what one way of looking at it would be perhaps to hope that the United States would realize that it can no longer, under any circumstances, retain that kind of hegemony against those two competitors forever without shooting itself through the head. Now, I'm afraid that that doesn't appear or didn't appear under Trump, at least, to be the way that they were going to proceed. America was going to be great again. And under Biden, America was back. So instead of saying, we are no longer going to aspire to hegemony, we are going to share it with two aspiring, perfectly legitimately aspiring, peacefully aspiring powers. That would have been the way to go. It isn't the way it has gone. 
And unfortunately, Russia has been pushed and pushed over the years to the point where Putin, rightly or wrongly, has decided to take the aggressive course. And that then requires aggression back. So far, we haven't got aggression back. And let's hope that Biden's restraint on this and NATO's restraint, to the extent there is any, is going to last. Because that sharing between the three potential superpowers is the only way, it seems to me, that the world can progress to anything like the sort of options that we've been discussing tonight. And certainly um, for Australia, it's absolutely critical that we do not find ourselves confronting China over this sort of thing. Would you agree? Yes, uh, I would agree that that would be the best case scenario. But the problem is, and this is where the Thucydides trap, sort of the, the knowledge has been updated. So Thucydides trap concept uh, has been merged with the power transition theory. The problem is that when the rising power is getting close to, to the established hegemon in terms of comprehensive material capabilities, we're entering a very dangerous uh, stage of, of international politics. So when, when the gap is huge, then it's, it's, it's quite safe because there is no point in challenging the unipol. When it's getting closer, this is very dangerous. This is when things become very dangerous. The problem with, I think this is a great, would be great, but the problem is that established hegemons are, not, are never willing to share the, the hegemony or the, the world order. Uh, there is a great study of Thucydides' trap, I think by uh, Graham Allison from Harvard University, who studied like 20 power transitions or 15 power transitions in world history. And he discovered only I think only three out of 15, I might be wrong with the exact number, but very uh, like, like about 20% of power transitions uh, turn out to be peaceful. All the rest ended up in a war. And one of the peaceful power transitions was between uh, Great Britain and the United States. So uh, now we're dealing with different countries, no matter what, Great Britain and US are sort of, you know, there is an element of affinity between, between the two. Now we're dealing with very different cultures, very different powers. Uh, that would, I agree 100% that that would be the best case scenario. But my concern is that based on the evidence we have and based on the uh, IR knowledge that we have, the chances are very slim because in most cases, the established superpower is not willing to, to share or sort of to let it happen peacefully. So yeah, we can be optimistic. There's still like 20% of cases when it can be peaceful, but, um, and this is of course the win-win, everyone wins in this, in this scenario. But the problem is that it, um, it's not always the case. We've got time, I think, for one more online question. So our question is from uh, Frank van Bernigen, and it thanks you for an excellent presentation from the realist perspective of international relations, but ask, don't you think that norms and values and the mobilizing character of democracy and individual freedom play a role in the outcome of this conflict? And thanks to you is a Netherlands diplomat from a small country. Yeah, well, they do, they do play a role up until a certain point, I think. Uh, they, they are extremely important, I think, at the early stages. But when, when the great power rivalry enter, enters this open confrontation stage, this is, uh, this is where things are becoming very different, because, difficult, because uh, what we see here is that democracies are also behaving in a way as if they're pursuing geopolitical interest rather than, uh, rather than uh, norms and uh, values. Like, look, the, the, the spread of democracy after the collapse of the Soviet Union is not only a normative policy, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very uh, realist kind of approach because the, the United States benefits from dealing with 
with democratic states benefits from having more democracies in the international system. And this is, this is an objective interest. So it's, uh, um, it's driven by the consideration of the interests. So, well, of course, uh, I'm not dismissing norms and values uh, and the attractiveness of the democratic model, but I think there is a limit because uh, when it really comes to existential threats, and in this case, I think whether it's right or wrong, but Moscow sees NATO as an existential threat. So when it comes, and, 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 and Europe is increasingly, I think, concerned about, about Russia. When it really gets, into, gets to the level when we are talking about security consideration, this is when norms and values give way to uh, hardcore geopolitics. Sadly, we'll have to call the place there. But let me just make sure I'm down front. Thank you. <clears throat> Many thanks to all of our participants for such interesting questions and points of discussion. Our next event will be on Tuesday, the 22nd of March. And I'm very happy to say that we'll be back to our normal events. We'll be having as many of you as like to come here at Lava Cottages, paying the traditional fee, which I might point out hasn't increased since 2018, a meeting for, for natterings and drinks and refreshments, and then proceeding to an address. And that will be by Dr. Olga Boychuk from the University of Sydney, who's going to speak on the digital and technological at role of the role of digital and media and technologies oh, right, in contemporary warfare. So we're still not getting very far away from war, but a, a, new, a new angle on do join us on the 22nd of March right here at Glover Cottages. But to finish off this evening's event, I'd like to invite one of our interns, Emily Shelley, to move a vote of thanks. Um, hello, I'm Emily, an intern here at the AIIA New South Wales. Um, on behalf of the Institute, I'd like to formally propose a vote of thanks to you, Dr. Korolev, um, for your presentation tonight. And I think I speak for all of us when I say that you provided a very insightful um, and well-informed presentation on what is, you know, such a complex and devastating situation in Ukraine, um, particularly in light of what this crisis means um, for the international system and great power rivalry more broadly. Um, so once again, thank you, Dr. Karolev. It was a privilege to hear your presentation tonight.